First, is President Obama acting like the bypasser in chief? The White House is making it crystal clear that President Obama could bypass Congress on everything from the debt ceiling to gun control. For starters, Vice President Biden saying today the president may impose gun control with an executive order. Former Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich joins us. Nice to see you, sir. Good to be with you. All right, your thoughts? I have to say, by the way, oh. you have the most amazing program tonight that I can remember. It's quite vast and quite uh, varied, I'd say. Remarkable. You don't want to miss any of it, and uh, nobody wants to miss you either. So tell me, um, the president, uh, vice president says that uh, the president may use an executive order uh, for to impose gun control. Um, your thoughts? Well, the president can try to do almost anything if he wants to. Uh, the question is, will he get away with it? And the two natural stands are, first, somebody will file a lawsuit uh, saying that it's illegal and unconstitutional. But second, the House uh, Republicans have an opportunity when the continuing resolution comes up at the end of March to simply zero out the authority, to say no money shall be spent. Now, that's so clear under our Constitution. It goes all the way back to the Magna Carta, a copy of which sits in the Capitol Dome. Um, I think that it would be a very interesting fight. I mean, the president clearly coming off this election is going to push everything he can to the edge. He has no interest in negotiating. He wants to push the country as far as he can. Sooner or later, the House Republicans have to decide that they are going to cheerfully draw lines in the sand, and the Constitution gives them the power. The greatest power the Congress has is the power of the purse. And all they have to say is, you have no money to do this. All right, we have three co-equal branches of government. That's a given. Uh, I'm curious, when can a president use an executive order? Uh, and when can't he? Is there, well, what's the line of demarcation? An executive order comes from the idea of to execute the law. So, so he's as long have as it's basically the, the Congress passes a law, the president wants to execute that law. So he issues an order saying we're going to do the following things. But what he can't do is write a new law. So if, let's take let's take first the example of gun control. Um, is would if he issues an executive order where he has a uh, an idea in his mind about what gun control should be? Can he issue an executive order? Is that uh, executing an order, or is that just making up his own? He's making up his own. Okay, and so now, that's where the line's drawn. And, and at that point, the correct answer by the Congress is to cut off the money and to say no money shall be spent to do this. All right. Well, um, I, don't, I don't know how he's going to, uh, I don't even know if money comes into play with uh, gun control if he's going to do that. Sure, but cut off ATF, you mean whatever. In other words, a president sitting in the White House can't execute anything. He's going to order somebody to do something. And what the Congress does is it says to those people, whatever, whether it's the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, or the FBI, or the Border Patrol, says no money can be spent to implement this. All right. Period. All right. Well, who? But then, I mean, now he's engaged in a really ugly battle, yeah. a very ugly battle. Right. And he's going to say that the Republicans are against law enforcement. They don't want the streets. They don't want the borders protected because they've just cut off the funding Look, for in, the border. In, in the hundredth anniversary of the birth of Richard Nixon. Nixon, who did several things that got him in deep trouble, would never have dreamed of the level of power grab that Obama, at least according to Biden and according to others, is trying to do. Uh, the same thing with the National Labor Relations Board, which has now decided, based on an obscure 1935 rule, that they will be involved in non-union companies because they've decided to reinterpret what that law well, means. A, a power grab, to, in my mind, is when you do something you simply don't have the lawful authority to do. He doesn't. And, the president doesn't. Okay. And so if, the, if there's no law that he would be executing by virtue of an executive order with gun control, instead he's got to look to Congress to doing it, that would be uh, an unlawful exercise. That would be a power grab. Right. And, okay. the, and the two ways you deal with it are you either take him to court or the Congress cuts off the money. Does Congress have the sort of um, wherewithal? I mean, do, do they have the drive to do that? We Congress. don't know yet. I mean, I, my, my, I would think the, the number one test the House Republicans are faced with as they go off to their, their planning retreats this week and next week is simple. The real power of the Congress is to not spend money. Are they prepared, starting with the continuing resolution uh, and, and with the sequester, are they prepared to say to the president, we're not going to spend the money? All right, well, looking at the, uh, at the uh, horizon, at this Congress and this Speaker of the House, um, do, and the, do you see them united enough to do something like that? Oh, I think if they talk it through, they could be that united. Yeah, I, I, th I think that, in fact, they're much more unified than people believe. 
uh, and that this would actually be a fairly easy fight because it goes to the heart of the Republican coalition, which is a smaller government, less spending, more balanced budget coalition. All right, let me talk about the debt ceiling because there's some discussion about um, the president, uh, the White House su suggesting that they don't have to go to Congress to raise a debt ceiling, that they can instead rely on the 14th Amendment of the, con of the Constitution. I did a little research going back to when this whole debt ceiling business started, basically in 1917, and what it was, it was to give some more ease to the White House to, uh, to, to, to borrow money. It was not to give the White House a blank open credit card. And so now, though, um, the president says, doesn't even matter about this 1917 law, I'm just going to do it? Because the Constitution says I can? Well, he, I mean, he can try to do that. I, I think it would be a disaster on a number of fronts. Um, president Obama's strength, Congress is saying no, and they're involved in some kind of a fight, and he's saying, let's do the right thing. For the president now to step in and create a proposal that goes back 150 years and to say something no president has ever said, that the president of the United States can unilaterally create debt, I think would be taking a pretty big burden and would isolate him pretty rapidly. And, and people around the world would say, wait a second, what if I buy Obama bonds and then it turns out they're illegal? I mean, he would be entering into the marketplace a level of uncertainty that would be pretty remarkable. Do you, do you think he's is sort of just saber-rattling and that he has no intention of sort of oh. doing it unilaterally, relying on the Constitution? Or do you think that he believes he has authority and he's going to do it? No, I, look, I think this is a very smart team. I'm, I'm, I'm one of the people who has grudgingly decided that Obama and his team actually know what they're doing pretty well. They want to fight over the debt ceiling because it is a dead loser for Republicans. I mean, you get you into the whole good faith and credit of the United States, are you going to really honor your debt? Are you really going to be the first people ever to default? What they don't want to fight over are the continuing resolution and the sequester because that's spending. And they don't want to get into a spending fight because they know that every survey shows that three out of four Americans believe you can cut government spending and the country does not believe this government is efficient and they don't believe it's as small as it could be. So the president will do everything he can to keep this fight in the debt ceiling, because that's his best fight, and they are terrified of getting mired up. Imagine that the congressional Republicans said, we're going to pass a 30-day continuing resolution in March, and in that 30-day resolution, we're going to kill the 10 dumbest offices in the federal government, and you, the voters, can go to our new website, and you can vote for what you think the 10 should be. And then we're going to come back 30 days later at the end of April, and we're going to pass a 30-day continuing resolution, and we're going to kill the next 10 dumbest offices, and you get to define what they are. You would have, I mean, how does the president go on TV and defend out of a $3 trillion, $700 billion budget? How does he defend the 10 dumbest offices? Do you know how dumb the 10 dumbest offices probably are? Uh, I could probably imagine I live and work here. All right. <laughs> I, I, I read that, um, you, that you've sort of rethought the Defense of Marriage Act, that you have a different thought as it reflects on the Republican Party. That, well, I, let me explain it to me, your change. Well, I'm, I'm very concerned. I, I believe, as a matter of, of faith, uh, that marriage is between a man and a woman. I think everything uh, that we know of in terms of the Bible and in terms of the teaching of the church says marriage is between a man and a woman. I also believe, as a matter of fact, that nine states have now adopted a law which is different than that. And that poses very real and complex human circumstances. And I think a, a, the practical reality is how are we going to deal with that fact? And, and it's not that I want to change my belief. I think uh, that, in fact, it's a big mistake to, to be confused about this issue. But I think it's also a legal reality that now people are being allowed uh, to, to create legal status over here. And if they create it in Maryland and they go on a trip and something happens to them on that trip, what happens? What, what's their status if they want to go to the local hospital? And so I think this is, a, this is a very complicated human problem, and Republicans need to take a deep breath and understand we need to deal with the human side of this equation and understand that we want to defend marriage in, in its classic form to a man and woman. I don't accept that there's an alternative. You know, the government can declare that a Ford truck is Air Force One. That doesn't mean it can fly. Does this mean that if this were before you today to vote 
a new the defense of marriage act that you would not vote in favor of it that having you know looked at where the what you know the uh, evolution of where the country has gone and the feeling of so many americans and the number of states no. that have, would, would that change your vote no, no, the defense of marriage act is a fair is a very specific bill that says because one state maryland to take an example happens to vote uh that that marriage extends beyond a man and woman doesn't mean that can be imposed in any other state i would still defend the right of any individual state so you basically to not Push it off as sort of federalism but, but, I'm, but I'm saying but I'm saying as a matter of practical reality we have to deal we conservatives have to deal with the objective fact that nine states have adopted a rule which is now going to make life more complicated and it, it's not enough to I mean again I'm, I'm not in my personal views in my beliefs I don't I don't back up an inch from the core belief of the Bible and the core belief of my church that marriage is between a man and a woman but I am trying to understand how are we going to cope with the complexity that this fact has now entered into our life has the Republican Party been tone deaf or unwilling to face that human aspect I think the party, first of all, is a very complicated institution and has a lot of different people in it, uh, some of whom, in fact, were much more prepared to to accept that than others. But I think, I think on balance, we're going to remain the conservative party. We're going to remain a party that believes in core traditional values. We're going to be, remain a party which, which defends religious liberty. Uh, and, we're going to remain, and, and we've got to learn to do it much, much better. I, I watched us get outmaneuvered by the left over and over for the last couple of years in ways that I found frustrating and infuriating. And I don't think, and I think we have to learn from that. Mr. Speaker, always nice to see you, sir. Thank Thanks, you. Sir.